Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. If you're thinking this doesn't look like my base, you'd be 100% correct. Today, we start an ongoing series called Colony Fixer Upper. And by Fixer Upper, we're just going to be throwing suggestions on what we notice and what we like and what we think might end up hurting the base in the long run. Additionally, in the Colony Fixer Upper series, we're going to concentrate on taking a look at some amazing bases and doing whatever the awesome community member who sent me the save file asks. If they ask what my opinion on Project X is, I'm going to give my opinion on Project X. If they ask me to just take a general look at the area and see what I think, that's what I'm going to do too. And we're going to start off with a colony from one Daniel Johnston. Now, Daniel sent this save file all the way from the great country of Canada and is having a little bit of issue with his industrial quarter. And we're going to get to that. But first, we need to give some credit where some credit is due. To start off with, I think the colony is absolutely beautiful. I love when you have colonies that haven't weighed lace to the entire area. Now, I'm sure Daniel's eventually going to get to it, getting rid of all this natural stuff. But for right now, it just looks like a work of art. The map seed is incredible. We start off with two hydrogen vents that are fairly close to each other. Well, they're not so close to each other, but Daniel made it work by connecting them together and then siphoning out the hydrogen for use as power. Great idea. And he's cooling down the hydrogen by use of this polluted water. Now, this one's gonna scare a few of you. This is a cooling loop. It's a rather large cooling loop. Yeah, this cooling loop wraps the entire colony. Pretty impressive. And it's running polluted water, so it's gonna have enough thermal conductivity to cool the whole place down. Or heat the whole place up. Whatever the specific requirement is at that time. The one thing I would caution about, though, is we know the more pipe segments we have, the later the game goes, the more sluggish the colony's gonna get. Lucky for Daniel, it looks like we have an anti-entropy thermo nullifier right here. And since we have such a beautiful source of hydrogen, maybe crack open and start pumping the hydrogen into the anti-entropy thermo nullifier and use the cooling coming off of it. That is a low power way that will provide all the cooling we need for this hydrogen. Just an idea that I think could be effective, especially considering he has more than one anti-entropy thermo nullifier. This could be a great little system that also incorporates maybe some sleet weight. Not that we're not already running sleet weight pretty effectively too. Speaking of which, Daniel's also running a bunch of grub fruit being tended to by some sweetles, a completely natural thimble reed farm, which is going to give him plenty of thimble reed without costing him much of anything. And since they're being tended, well, they're going to grow even quicker. He's also running bristle blossom, more trees than you can shake a stick at, and even some pinch of pepper plants and some mealwood to feed some glossy drecos. As for critters, when Daniel decided what critter he's going to run, he just said we're going to run all the critters. Love the joint incubation center here. Really consolidates the duped efforts when loading up and delivering critter eggs. Very cool. Yes, he's also running smooth hatchlings. And to the best of my knowledge, why is he running all that? Oh, well, that's because Daniel wants all the food. We start off the main course with some surf and turf. And what do we finish it off with? Oh, yes. Mixed berry pie. That's right. Daniel's running two of the best foods in the game. Mixed berry pie, which is a superb quality of plus five. That will give dupes a plus 16 to morale. Look at these morale ratings. Most of the duplicates are running between 50 and 60 morale. Absolutely incredible. And I also like the Pokemon naming theme. Very cool. And just because, we have to see what old Pikachu is good at. Yep, Pikachu here has got improved carry too, plumbing, and exosuit training. And it's a good thing that Pikachu is skilled at plumbing, because there's a lot of it. What you have to like seeing, though, is this large liquid fuel tank sorting system. There is a bunch of liquid filters here that are sorting out all the liquids as they come in. This large liquid cargo tank holds some water after any salt water or polluted water goes through the water sieve. 
Then we have some crude oil here. We have some petroleum being sorted into here. And we got some more petroleum being sorted into here. And Daniel's using rocket platforms all over his base. That way he can utilize some of the superior storing mechanics that come with liquid cargo modules and gas cargo canisters. Why stop there though? We also have rockets that are only just giant battery modules. Oh, you thought this was just it? Nope, not quite. And where's all that power coming from? Well, an absolutely gargantuan solar panel array. Some other awesome things about this colony. We have some nature reserves right up one of the center most travel corridors. And there's an absolute ton of decor all around the colony. One suggestion I'd like to make with the power grid though, is you could really conserve some space and even pack in some more solar panels if you use the pyramid method of construction. And in case you don't know what the pyramid construction is, what we do is we build them on top of each other, sort of like this, and you leave a space in between them. And that way, when you build them, there's still enough light going to this one and enough light going to this one, where it'll provide more than half of what a regular solar panel does. And then this solar panel will get a full amount. Now, unfortunately, since all of these are already built, that would be a world of a construction project. One method that might make it a little easier is the sort of stacking pyramid method. And that's just sort of doing this all the way up as far as you want to go and then bringing it all the way back down. This will still conserve you more space and give you a ton of power in the meantime. One thing that I'm definitely going to implement in some of my colonies is there's a bunch of disconnected transit tubes. Typically in my colonies, I have one giant transit tube sort of spine that runs the entire height of the colony, which is all great and good, but I never really separate them to where you can have them on both sides or, or maybe a transit tube system that just connects two areas and doesn't really worry about whether or not it runs the entire distance of the colony. I like that. Now I wanted to highlight this power grid. You'll notice that the heavy watt conductive wire goes down two sides of the base. This gives Daniel the ability to get power anywhere he needs without having to make super long conductive wire runs. I thought that was a nice touch as well. And that's probably the reason why he has such great decor around here because those heavy watt wires are really trying to beat him in. Now the heavy watt wires are being wrapped with the occasional masterpiece painting, which is again, another very nice touch. Now it's to be noted that Daniel said this is the furthest he's ever made it in Ani. And for that reason alone, I think this is a pretty great accomplishment because as some of the more experienced players will know, once you've been into a late game, you kind of know what to expect. Where Daniel's figuring a lot of it out as he goes and I think so far he's right on the right track. Something I would like to warn him about though, you're going to be in trouble when it comes to lag later in the game. Because Daniel's running so many critters and so many different types of critters. I mean, we even have Paku down here, all the Sweetles tending to all the crops, Grub Grubs, Pips, because why not? And then a total population of 31 duplicates. I think his rig is going to be in for it. Now, the good news is he's only at cycle 825. So he's got a little bit longer before he really starts feeling the lag train. Before he does get into Lag City, I'm sure he'd like this industrial quarter to be up and running. Now this is a pretty standard design for an industrial quarter. He smartly incorporates the iron volcano into it to add that additional heat. Unfortunately, what looks like has happened is the iron volcano went dormant and the duplicates weren't doing too much in here. So all of that steam got too cool, which caused this place to vacuum out. Now we have a tile and a half of water that we're going to need to reboil to get this whole thing working again. You'll notice these window tiles. The problem with the windows tiles means that this industrial quarter is actually sharing temperature with this area down here. And this might be where I can provide the biggest lesson. We've showed how Daniel is running all the foods. That literally might be three quarter of the food that's available in the game. He's also filtering out all the liquids and storing all the liquids. Likewise, we're doing the same thing with the gases. And this can be advantageous when you need to plug into some of those things. But here's my recommendation. 
it's always better to be able to do a single thing really well than do many things average. And that has nothing to do with your skill, but rather just in the capability of, for instance, the colony. Now, the decision to make all this food might just be a limitation on the fact that he's running 31 dupes and needs enough. But I'd be willing to bet if he's running this much surf and turf, well, we could just do surf and turf. Or if we're running that much grub food, maybe just do the grub fruit. We also have berry sludge. There's a lot of different things that we could probably simplify. And simplification probably be the biggest key. And that may have been what went wrong here. Now a great job was done by adding all these temperature shift plates, which would help transfer all the temperature coming from down here to up here, up to these steam turbines. But this area is so large and it's holding so much water that as soon as this iron volcano went dormant, or as soon as the duplicates stopped using this so much, you were heading for Hurt City. Now remember, an iron volcano by itself is very hot. Unfortunately, it only erupts 42 seconds out of 744. One methodology you could do to get this back into working order is maybe put a rail system in here that sends all of the iron up through the industrial area before dropping it off maybe neatly at the entrance for easy access for the dupes. You could also consolidate all of this down because you probably don't need this much space in your industrial center and that way you'll have an easier job maintaining that heat. I would also consider insulating it in and separating it from this natural gas. If this natural gas needs its own source of cooling, then just provide it. After all, you might have the world's largest water cooling systems. So I guess the big tip of the day for this colony and for all of you watching at home, simplify. Make your colony a master of a few things instead of a jack of all traits. And that way, when you get into the very late game, you're not trying to keep 40 systems going. You're only trying to maybe keep 12. But then again, why not just run 40? Who knows? We never know where this colony is going to end up. Great job, Daniel. I think it's looking good. Our next colony comes from Spiros Ceres. And I'm really sorry if I butchered that name. I gave it the old college try. The first thing I wanted to highlight about Spiros's colony is look at the mods. Wow. This is someone who's not afraid to put on a mod and see where it takes them. Some of my favorites here are critter renames, because why not rename your critters? But also, Happy Digging Dwarf Edition. I don't know what that is, but I already love it. Now, the first thing to notice about this colony is it is, again, gorgeous. I love the natural terrain and the colony kind of intertwined through it. I really have to do a better job of doing this in the future. Maybe one day I'll do sort of an ant colony game where we don't build any walls. I wonder how that would work out. Now, Spiros was asking just for general ideas and improvements that we could make to the colony. And quite frankly, they've already made it to cycle 1501. So at the minimum, this is a successful colony, right? I mean, the duplicates here all have their own individual bedrooms. Although I wonder why some of them get carpet and while some of them are sleeping on fertilizer. Someone apparently is living in the barn. We have a very large crude oil supply and it's good thing too because we have an amazing petroleum boiler here. Look at this work of art. We are starting to get this problem here with the igneous rock though. What has happened is the igneous rock has turned into a tile which is sort of preventing more igneous rock from forming which I don't think is too big of a problem right now because it looks like there's some igneous rock here as well that is still transferring its temperature into this liquid lead tile. Yes, you heard that right. Which then goes into this window tile, which is then being siphoned off a of heat through this mechanized airlock. It eventually ends to this nice petroleum bath. You can see here that the window tiles really do not fluctuate in temperature so much because the window tiles are sitting around 420 and that is by design. And this is probably because Spiros doesn't want any crude oil forming. And you'll see that as soon as even a splash of crude oil comes, it instantly turns into petroleum. I love unique designs like this. It really highlights how you can take something as awesome and intricate as petroleum boiler and do it in so many different ways. I mean, even this system here, 
It has mechanized airlocks, opening, letting a little bit, just a little bit of petroleum in, and then it forces the petroleum through by closing the airlocks one after another. And just so you can see, the automation to get this to work, well, it's not simple, but it's very effective. Now, something else to keep in mind is we are experiencing some very hot insulated tiles, and that's because there's some polluted oxygen in here. Now, there's almost four kilos of polluted oxygen, which makes me believe that this area was never vacuumed out. And you could get away with this if we ended up double insulating this area. But as it stands, these insulated tiles are 350 degrees. And although they don't transfer much temperature, they do transfer temperature. And you can see the tiles out here are around 70 degrees Celsius. Something that you have to keep in mind of. I love the filled in areas down in the oil biome. I think this always gives it such a nice clean look. And look at this beautiful system here. We have two oil wells working in tandem with a beautiful amount of just natural gas. That is a lot of natural gas that you're able to do just about anything with. In fact, if we follow the natural gas all the way up, we find it's joined by a natural gas geyser. Comes all the way through here, all the way up, all the way up into a lot of gas reservoirs into eight natural gas generators. We also have some petroleum generators in here and a lot of coal generators for some beautiful backup power. So Spiros has this row of natural gas generators on 9080, these on 9060, and then everything else on 8010. Oh, wait a minute, not the coal generators, they're set on 8010 as well, okay. One suggestion here though, these natural gas generators are designed to be the primary source of power, but all that natural gas might not be heading there in the most efficient manner. You see we're splitting the natural gas with these reservoirs with this one single reservoir and then it delivers some here. These reservoirs then join. Then we have some more reservoirs here. I would try to consolidate all of these into a single pipe run. And that way you have one smooth delivery system. And one benefit to that is you wouldn't have to play the gas pipe spaghetti. Because I'm not quite sure why we're not seeing a lot more throughput. Now, one of the reasons is because down here we have the Atmos sensors that are saying, hey, make sure we keep at least five kilos of natural gas. One thing you could do is tie this automation into some of these reservoirs. So that way, when you get low on natural gas, like we are right now, it kicks those pumps on and will actually siphon out some more natural gas, which would be especially useful when all those beautiful natural gas geysers go dormant. And I understand why he wants to make sure that there's at least five kilos of natural gas in here. If this place ever got vacuumed out, it'd be bad news bear for some of this equipment. But for giggles, we could just put it on 2K and we'd still have plenty of pressure in this room to where nothing else would be able to off gas. It would stay a complete room of natural gas and, and now we have a little bit more flow, at least temporarily. Second, Spiros has a huge petroleum supply and it's feeding these petroleum generators, but they're not getting a chance to work. In fact, they don't kick on until it's under 10. These petroleum generators are by far your most powerful energy sources. If we put these even on 8060, watch how quick this battery just climbs up. Even with the massive amount of power draw, those four petroleum generators handle it like a boss. And you'll notice these natural gas generators still stay on but they're not responsible for 90% of the power generation like they are now. I would also recommend kicking these coal generators as sort of an emergency backup. You could keep these at 10 or even put them down at five. And I'm only saying that because we're down to 328 tons of coal. And the last thing we want is for us to need that coal to run these generators and not have it. Now I wanna point out this absolutely amazing hatch farm. Look at the ingenuity here. This is all being ran by one auto sweeper. I have never seen anything like this, but this is absolutely wonderful. The hatches are still very close to the grooming station, so it doesn't take them long at all to be able to be groomed. And then this auto sweeper can grab all the eggs and knows exactly what to do with them. And that send them to this awesome meat factory right here, where then it's taken and sent down to the kitchen. Additionally, the auto sweeper can also send all of the coal 
and drops it off right here. Now, for some reason, we have a small backup here. Oh, that's to keep these conveyor receptacles filled. And that way, the auto sweepers can hit the conveyor receptacles instead of the standard storage bin system. That's a pretty good idea. I like that. Pretty handy when all of your coal needs are being delivered via rail. You'll notice down here we're also starting to have some temperature difficulties and I can't help but think it's coming from this area here. Now we did double insulate some of it in the corner, but in Spiros' save file, they're going to have to do a lot of work to make sure that they keep all this heat contained. Otherwise, it's just going to keep spreading more and more. And that just might be the moral of the story that Sparrow's colony has helped us learn. Remember, as beautiful as all this natural territory is, you have a lot of room. You don't have to cram a petroleum boiler right next to everything else. Well, in this case, he had the volcano here, so this is kind of convenient for where the petroleum boiler is. But if that's going to be the case, make sure you double insulate everything in. And that way, the areas of your colony can truly stay separated. Now, Spiros is trying to combat some of this with using ceramic insulated tiles. Quite frankly, you don't have to use ceramic insulated tiles around here. Just double insulate this with two layers of insulated granite and go to town. This is a perfect example of what I was trying to highlight in our last colony. This is a beautiful pyramid that helps us save space. And it looks almost like Spiros was trying to test which ones were actually going to be more effective. You'll notice this is eight solar panels all put side by side. This is seven solar panels in a pyramid formation. It takes up a lot less space. Now we'll wait till midday before we take a look at the final power reading. And there's no doubt these eight solar panels are going to be producing more power. But considering how many more solar panels you can get into the light this way... I don't know which one's better because once you build the solar panels all the way across like this there's no light under here that's it so in this example we have seven solar panels and 28 tiles of width and in this example it took 49 tiles to do seven so i guess it's all about the needs and requirements of your base this is definitely easier to do this requires a lot more laddering and can definitely be a pain but the payoff might be worth it in the end I wanted to highlight a beautiful implementation on the industrial quarter. Now, a couple things you'll notice. There are transit tubes being utilized here. Gets the dupes in and out very quickly. And the only thing this is being asked to do is just the industrial quarter. There's no window tiles that all the heat is bleeding into. And four of these metal refineries are actually set on iron and steel, which helps them be used equally, which really helps distribute the heat. And even with a large area like this, there's only two steam turbines required. Now, in the last colony, there was an iron volcano in it. And an iron volcano by itself takes two steam turbines. Just something to note for everyone else, if there happens to be a volcano in your area, you will need extra steam turbines. But in this specific implementation, Spiros could get away with less. It also helps that they're running polymer presses in here that put off a lot of heat. The Glass Forge 2... Another beautiful implementation of the mess hall with the recreation area. This is great. I love the natural tiles that were able to stay in place. A little bit of carpet really helps sell the wear stranded on an asteroid feel. Some of the other nice designs on this colony. Beautiful copper volcano tamer. Definitely could be done simpler because, quite frankly, a copper volcano doesn't need a thermo aqua tuner. You could literally strap a couple steam turbines on it fill it with some water and leave it alone but here we have a nice system that pushes all the copper out and drops it off right here and it's not too bad at about 123 degrees which is the reason why i've really stopped sending all my metal ores outside of the volcano area using rails because the coldest you're going to be able to get them in a simplified system like this is the 125 degrees or so because that's the temperature of the steam so unless you're sending this into some sort of item locker implementation, Spiros could have left this open and went and got the copper whenever he needed it and maybe saved a little bit of power. But there's nothing wrong with this, and I love when people practice and try out new things. As for food, the number one is fried mushrooms. Unfortunately, I, for the life of me, can't find anywhere where there's dust caps growing. So my only guess is that we've transitioned from the dust caps into grub fruit 
and maybe some mealwood over here. These days, a lot of people are transitioning to the grub fruit because it gives you access to berry sludge, grub fruit preserve, and those sort of things. Based on the relatively new amount of sleet wheat being grown, I'll bet you this is where all of the mushrooms were coming from. Very cool transitioning right into the sleet wheat because, yep, sleet wheat can be grown in carbon dioxide too. The last thing I wanted to highlight on this colony is this beautiful oxygen center. We have a standard full Rodriguez, but it's connected seamlessly with an oxygen cooling system. Now this may look like spaghetti, but this is well done here. All of the oxygen coming out is instantly being cooled in this area. The oxygen's going from 70 degrees and comes out at 25, 30 degrees. Very nicely done. And using the thermoregulator, this can be done very early in the game. Really like how this looks. Another thing I wanted to highlight about both of these colonies. One was almost at cycle 900 and this one is sitting just after 1500. Don't be scared to sit on your main colony. Don't be scared to really build it out before you even start exploring the solar system. In my eyes, it makes it easier because you're organized, everything is set before you start on your rocketry program. Now, this may not exactly be possible on a spaced out start. I can't tell 100%, but this looks like a classic start based on the size of the colony. Regardless, take your time. Don't rush the space. Get your dupes comfortable, get your food, your oxygen sorted. Take things slow. And remember the two lessons that we learned today. Simplify your creations, simplify your colony, and on top of that, space out your creations. Give yourself some breathing room, and that way if you need to squeeze something in a little later, you can. I want to give a special shout out to both Daniel and Sparos for sending me their save files. This episode would have been a little bit longer, but... These two are the only ones that sent in their save files. I want to thank them for their courage. I want to thank them for their generosity and letting us take a look in judging their creations. And in my eyes, I think both colonies are two thumbs up. A lot of beautiful things in here. Little tweaks here and there. But if you ever find somebody who says, yeah, their colony's perfect and doesn't need any tweaks, well, I don't really have an end to that pun because, well, I don't think you'll find one. So in the next couple months, if you end up creating a colony that you want me to take a look at, please consider sending me that save file. It'd be great to have the community get their eyes on it. We can admire and appreciate your work, just like we did with these two fine members of our community. I had a great time in these two colonies. I hope you did too. And I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>